Welcome everyone. My name is uh, Robert Nelson and I am um, a, an emeritus professor at Yale University. And together with my colleague, Vasilis Marinas, we, have, um, we work to put together this lecture series, which is in its third year. Uh, our purpose is to present uh, interesting scholarship from around the academic world, um, having to do with the period of late antiquity, the end of the Roman Empire up until the end of the Byzantine Empire, and even perhaps beyond in the case of our last lecture uh, in the series. We have a balance of younger and older scholars and uh, uh, try to have, uh, try to uh, foreground the scholarship of European scholars who uh, perhaps may not be that well known in America uh, and to the, to the local community at Yale University. Our first lecture today is by an old friend, very distinguished scholar, Robert Osterhout, whom I might call the Dean of Architectural Historians for, of the Byzantine Empire in the world. And he will be introduced by my colleague, Vasilis Marinas. Vasily? Good afternoon. It is not unusual to find distinguished professors at places like the University of Pennsylvania. Yet, even in the midst of such eminent company, one comes across biographies that give pause for all the right reasons. Such is the case with our speaker today. Robert Wusterhout is Professor Emeritus of History of Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Before moving to Philadelphia, he was Professor of Architectural History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he taught for more than 20 years. A recognized specialist in Byzantine architecture, his research focuses on the documentation and interpretation of the vanishing architectural heritage of the Eastern Mediterranean. His fieldwork has concentrated on Byzantine architecture, monumental art, and urbanism in Constantinople, Thrace, Cappadocia, and Jerusalem. Professor Oosterhout's publications and contributions are simply too numerous to discuss in detail. He's the author most recently of Eastern Medieval Architecture, The Building Traditions of Byzantium and Neighboring Lands, published by Oxford University Press in 2019, and winner of the Huskins Medal from the Medieval Academy of America. Another monumental study titled Visualizing Community, Art, Material, Culture, and Settlement in Byzantine Cappadocia appeared from Dumbarton Oaks in 2017. So therefore we are truly delighted to welcome Professor Oosterhout virtually to Yale. Thank you, Vasili. And let me share my screen. Okay, does everything look good to get started here? Yep, it looks great. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so windows onto sanctity. Windows, as we know from the Chicago School of Media Theory, demarcate a permeable boundary between interior and exterior, between public and private. Windows mediate between spaces and conditions. They illuminate, reveal, conceal, reflect, frame and organize our views. They encourage the gaze and are intimately connected uh, to sight and perception. Defined by absence and a frame, um, windows mark difference, easily conceptualized and transferred into the language of metaphor. Photographers and filmmakers love windows. Alfred Hitchcock fetishized them. So in this paper, I'd like to look through a variety of Byzantine windows, ones that are often overlooked or rather, shall I say, have not been looked into. Um, if a window opens between interior and exterior, its liminal character is clear. But what about interior windows? For example, that those that open between interior spaces in a church, 
do they function in the same way, bearing a similar valence? So today I'd like to look at some interior windows in Byzantine churches in Constantinople and Cappadocia, ones that encourage looking from one condition to another, that indicate sight lines or function in terms of communication, both visually and orally. And I should add that in this study, I owe a great deal to my three medieval colleagues at Yale, um, Jackie Young, Rob Nelson, and Vasilis Marinis, from whom I've learned a great deal about vision and the simple act of looking. So let me begin with a favorite site, the Kora Monastery in Istanbul, where Professor Nelson and I have spent a lot of time looking, both individually and together. The early 14th century church is replete with internal windows for looking through, looking into, and looking out of. Some simply played a role in the daily life of the church. While these apertures are easily overlooked, an investigation of their possible functions helps us to enliven the daily functioning of the church. For example, an, inter an internal window designed from the beginning was incorporated into the narrative program of Herod ordering the massacre of the innocents. Indeed, one of the soldiers appears to turn to look into it as he searches for the children of Israel. Now this particular window opens into the spiral stairs that originally led to the belfry accessed through a door at floor level. And I hear I follow the suggestion of Ernest Hawkins that the window would have allowed the bell ringer to see the start of the liturgical procession in the Uxonarthex and to ring the bells at the appropriate moment. Otherwise, how could he have known? There's no other uh, visual connection between the belfry and the church interior. But more than simply functional, I wonder occasionally if the window might have been interpreted symbolically as well. Would there be a special meaning to having this window in the midst of the massacre of the innocents, such as, for example, if the tolling of bells became associated with the funeral service, could they also be tolling for the innocents? Um, Athanasius Semelglou has proposed a connection between the massacre of the innocents and Theodore Medehidi's library, since he refers to his books as his children and worries about their preservation during his exile. It's a nice conceit. And on this basis, he suggests that the library may have been situated in the now lost belfry, although I believe it was elsewhere. A second internal window opens from the upper north annex into the nows, the decoration around it now lost. But from the position and details of this upper chamber, I argued that it functioned as the study or library for Theodore Medehides and would have allowed him to oversee and overhear the liturgical services in the Naus from a place of seclusion. It's more accessible and more easily located than the belfry. And an elevated um, private space for the founder is something we find at a variety of other locations that I think makes perfectly good sense here. Many churches had galleries above the narthex to provide a private space for the founders, but some are more elaborate. The 11th century church now known as the Eski Imaret Jami in Istanbul, which is sometimes identified as the Church of Christ Panopoptis, two small isolated cells uh, accessible only from the gallery are set above the western corners of the cross and square nows. Each is equipped with a small window overlooking the nows. And these were likely the cells of monastic recluses. And if the identification of the building as the Pentapoptes is correct, one of these may have belonged to the founder, Anna Dalasina, after she took monastic orders. Both were carefully fitted into the architectural design of the building. Indeed, from the ground level, they go almost unnoticed. Similarly, at the Catholicon of the Great Lavra Monastery on Mount Athos, um, St. Athanasius had a cell in the gallery level above the narthex overlooking the nows, although this no longer survives. <clears throat> 
Now the connections here may have been more auditory than visual in function, for they provided the occupants of the cell with limited vistas and no direct visual connection to the sanctuary. Hearing the liturgy may have been more important to the Byzantine solitary than seeing it. With the possible exception of Athanasius' cell at the Great Lavra, now destroyed, none had particularly good sight lines. Even Theodore Matahiti's window in the gallery of the Quora seems more practical for auditory, auditory uh, connection than for oversight. Indeed, as Jeffrey Featherstone emphasizes, acoustic comprehension was apparently as potent for Theodor Medichides as the visual. Rock cut architecture offers some interesting variations. The most famous example, the late 12th century in Clystra of St. Neophytos near Paphos on Cyprus, the irregular cave church had been painted around 1183 as part of a hermitage turned monastery of an eccentric local holy man. Neophytos subsequently added an isolated cell above the nous to which he could ascend and withdraw. Um, in the Typicon, the cell is called the New Zion with a small chamber below it uh, called the Hagiasterion. The latter had a window that opened from the floor of the cell into the irregular dome of the church below. This allowed Neophytos to hear and oversee the surfaces from his place of isolation. In this instance, the connection worked both ways for the window allowed the monks worshiping in the nows an occasional glimpse of the hermit. Um, the painted program of the church featured the ascension in the irregular vault and adjacent upper wall. And thus the holy man gazing through the window would have appeared framed as a part of the heavenly composition joining Christ inside the mandorla. Uh, that this was intended seems entirely in keeping with the eccentric personality of Neophytos, who often ascribed divine or demonic interventions to the mundane occurrences in his daily life. Similar idiosyncrasies uh, often color the vitae of medieval recluses in both East and West. Um, analogous situations are to be found in Cappadocia. Alas, the rock cut sites in Cappadocia lack the sort of personalizing documentation that the Typicon of Neophytos provides. And our analysis must be based on the physical evidence alone, something that is abundantly preserved in the region. Church two in the Kephes Valley, now partially collapsed, uh, began its life as an elevated hermitage with a nearby ground level chapel for visitors. When the two units were subsequently joined by a um, transverse barrel vaulted nave, the, her, um, the hermitage was provided with a chute in the, uh, to the uh, apsed south chapel below, allowing a connection between the hermitage and the church. Something similar is found in the Archangelos Monastery near Jamil, the double naved Catholicon dedicated to St. Michael has a complex history representing more than a millennium of carving, including a major restoration in the late 19th century. The two naves were painted in the uh, 13th century in two closely related phases, now much blackened by soot, through which the decorative program is still visible. The south nave's decoration is dated by inscription to 1217-1218. Uh, after its completion, an arch was opened between the two naves, cutting into the painted program, and this passageway was surmounted by a, an attenuated conical chute uh, where the two naves intersect. The north nave, conical chute, and narthex were then painted, probably in the second quarter of the, of the century. Now, this unusual conical chute terminates in an aperture at its crown that opens into a monastic cell above it. This was not simply fortuitous. The chute established a connection to the cell for an important inhabitant, perhaps a recluse, perhaps the abbot, at an upper level of the monastery. While the two barrel vaulted naves maintain conservative architectural forms, the oddly positioned chute would have appeared strange in any period, 
It may be best understood as an idiosyncratic solution to the special requirements within the monastic community, allowing the occupant of the cell to hear and observe the activities in the spaces below. Now the preceding examples, the connections to the cells above uh, represent afterthoughts. They do not affect the planning of the churches on the lower level. More importantly, the connections may have been more auditory than visual, for they provided the occupants of the cells with limited vistas and no direct uh, visual connection to the sanctuary. The situation um, within the masonry churches noted above is similar. Hearing the liturgy may have been more important to the Byzantine solitaire than actually seeing it. None had particularly good sideline, sight lines, as I noted earlier. Now, in contrast to the above examples, there are a few rock cut churches in Cappadocia um, in which visual access is given priority, as may be discerned from the close analysis of the physical evidence. The Tokale Kilise uh, in Gurame, probably the best known of the multiple phase church, rock cut churches in Cappadocia, um, is also one of the most complex with a distinct set of interrelated spaces on two levels. Um, a vestibule, um, its western portion long since destroyed, leads through a wide arch into the barrel vaulted old church, which may be dated by its painting circa 913 to 920. Just before the arch at the entrance on the left, a door leads to a storeroom. Um, Um, and a steep staircase leads down to the lower church, uh, which was equipped for burials. Immediately to the uh, east of the old church is the spacious new church, which may be dated by its painting shortly before 963-964. Lavishly detailed, um, it is set on a different orientation from the old church and includes a paraclasion. Uh, to its north. In its final form, um, the church uh, cluster sprawls. And a drawing by Annabelle Wharton helps to clarify uh, the spatial relationships, although it regularizes the complex's more eccentric features. Indeed, Tokali Kiwise is filled with jarring changes of axis, style, and levels of quality in both the painting and architecture all of which challenge attempts to determine the internal chronology. What was the order of creation? Just about the only point of agreement among scholars is that the new church postdates the old church as its paintings indicate. Well, to simplify a complex argument, the old church was rough, irregular with a lopsided vault painted by a local workshop. Its Western wall destroyed in a subsequent enlargement. The lower church was likely carved at the same time or shortly thereafter. It was left undecorated and equipped with tombs in the Arcasolia to the side. The apse of the old church was destroyed when the new church was added, but is clearly asymmetrical from the beginning. In contrast, the new church uh, was carefully carved and subsequently decorated by a talented painter, doubtless brought in from Constantinople in a cosmopolitan style and rich pigments. Um, a detail of the venerated image of the Virgin Eleusa indicates the quality of the painting. Well, what was the original context of the Tokali Kirise? An early 20th century photograph offers no clues. And with the erosion of the cliff face and the construction of the modern road, um, these have been totally obscured um, and as well as the connection to possibly, possible ancillary chambers to either side. But there's nothing here to suggest that this was part of a monastery, a monastic complex. To my mind, it raises the question, without the paintings of the new church, would we pay any attention to this site at all? And for those with the stamina, I've attempted to break down the chronology which I have detailed elsewhere. 
and so I won't belabor it here, but let me note that it led me to a series of questions. First, how did the site function? Um, there is no trace of monastic quarters around it. Um, second, how to account for the dramatic differences in both quality and architecture. Three, why to invest, why should we invest in a site that was rough and irregular? And fourth, how do we account for the odd angle at the connection of the old and new churches? Why would a wealthy patron invest in a site that was irredeemably pokey and irregular? This is one of the great mysteries of Cappadocia. Architecture is created by intention, not by accident. And the older portions of the complex were judged significant enough to be maintained with all their peculiarities intact. But why? As I realized, the questions are interrelated. Lynn Rodley once suggested, almost in passing, that the complex may have developed on the site of, or perhaps expanded from, the cave of a revered hermit. Although she does not elaborate further, nor locate the proposed hermitage, her suggestion is worth considering. In fact, this exclamation, explanation will uh, account for the storeroom to the north of the vestibule, which has gone either unaccounted or insufficiently documented in all the scholarship on Tokali Kivise. If this room were a functional component of the complex, it may help to explain many of the irregularities. And I would like to suggest that this was originally a hermit cell. Although oddly shaped, the room was equipped with benches along two walls, niches, including one facing eastward, possibly a font, and possibly a separate entrance now blocked. Um, its surviving entrance was immediately next to the entrance of the lower church, detailed by a door frame, and its lower level, uh, its floor level was at the same as the original level of the old church. Now the original position of the storeroom might also help to explain the trapezoidal plan of the old church, which seems to bend around it, and the oddly concave curvature of the north wall in the old church, uh, which retreats where the two spaces would have otherwise uh, connect, intersected. In short, um, the storeroom must have existed prior to the creation of the old church. The latter must have been carved in relationship to it. We might even attribute the irregularities of the old church to the pious but amateur efforts of the hermit or his followers. This may also explain the discrepancies between um, the rough carving and um, a more sophisticated painting in the old church. One significant detail has gone unmentioned in previous scholarship, but it supports my argument. Immediately inside the storeroom, um, uh, inside the storeroom door, uh, a small irregular aperture opens into the old church, clearly visible in the earliest photographs by uh, Gerfanion. This is thus of some antiquity. The opening is set at the corner, at the level of the dado, just below the figural program. This, I argue, was the Byzantine equivalent of a hagioscope, offering a privileged view to the recluse who inhabited the cell. Um, it is likely original, although it has been roughly enlarged. And because of the odd orientations of the complex, the trapezoidal plan of the old church, um, the window would have provided an almost axial view into the original sanctuary. So the woman in pink is looking through uh, the hagioscope here, and the view she sees is this, with a direct view into the sanctuary. Um, this originally um, would have led directly into the apse of the old church, and when the new church was added, that axis was maintained so that the view leads directly into the uh, main apse of the new church. Indeed, the maintenance of the privileged view provides the best explanation for the odd change of orientation between the two levels. Let me digress um, for a minute to explain what a hagioscope is 
Known from Western medieval church architecture, particularly in Britain, the hagioscope or squint is a small window that allows a view to the high altar, usually for solitaires or anchorites, that is, those who were isolated from the congregation. Texts for solitaires, such as the 13th century Anclina Visa, uh, often note a squint as one of the features of the anchoritic cell. Most important would be the possibility of ocular communion, that is, seeing the elevation of the host at the moment of transubstantiation, but without being seen. The hagioscope allowed a view um, that the architectural features normally would have blocked, but it did not otherwise interfere with the regular planning of the church interior. Unlike a standard window, a hagioscope limits and directs the view. It offers a controlled private view to an isolated individual. This, I believe, is how the opening at Tokale Kilise functioned. The hagioscope additionally provided an excellent view into the niche immediately to the left of the apse, decorated with a venerated image of the Theotokos Eleusa. Disfigured by graffiti, candle wax, and soot, um, the image was clearly the object of special devotion. Furthermore, the parapet immediately before the image was reduced in height to augment its visibility. It would thus seem that the planning of the old and new church depended on the privileged view from this small window. But the image of the Theotokos did double duty for the al odd alignment of the two vessels would place her image on axis with the nave of the old church. Whoever was responsible for the carving and subsequent painting of the new church managed uniquely to coordinate two unrelated visual axes in the overall design. The image of the, of the Virgin often appears as a central feature of a Byzantine apsidal composition. Thus, as the terminus of the old church sight line, the Virgin Eleusa niche seems to be thematically in the right place. But rather than a standard composition, such as the Virgin, the Deusis, or the Maestas Domini, the main apse of the new church is decorated uh, with the crucifixion, a comp uh, composition unique in this location. On the other hand, the crucifixion may have been related to the privileged view, which placed the occupant of the hermit cell before the altar, but also at the foot of the cross. And the crucifixion would have also emphasized the funerary function of the complex with the burials in the lower church quite literally at the feet of the hermit. In short, I suspect that previous and presumably sacred associations with the site led to the development and enlargement of the Tukale Kilise, as well as to the maintenance of its privileged site line at the expense of any semblance of symmetry. In the final analysis, the contrast of old and new, of regular and irregular, may have been intentional to um, intentionally maintain to emphasize the prestige of a site by emphasizing its history. The new enhances the old and adds to its luster. In addition, the plan integrates the public view, the axial view from the old church, and the private view, the sight line from the hagioscope into its design. The irregularities of the complex thus emerge as a sophisticated and planned interrelationship of spaces at the nexus of sacred presence and vision. Intriguingly, the odd change of axis appears in another Gourmet church, the so-called Little Tokali Kirise, first published by Wharton Epstein, who recognized it as a scaled down copy of the Tokali Kirise. Apparently carved in a single period, it was never painted and the carving, the carving is crisp and fresh suggesting limited use. It should date to the late 10th uh, or 11th centuries. The carver eliminated a few features uh, such as the sanctuary aisle and the lower church, but they maintained the transverse barrel vault with its ribs and bosses and divisions and arcading from the new church. Notably, um, sorry, notably the awkward angle um, 
uh, of the old church is replicated as well. The scale of the old church component was increased and regularized, however, and its lateral walls were arcaded, uh, creating a more unified interior. A series of smaller regular spaces appears to the Northeast. And one detail here is noteworthy. In the Northwest corner of the nave is a small rough aperture that opens from the lateral space in exactly the same position as the hagioscope in the Tokali Kibise. Because of the arcading, the view toward the sanctuary may have been partially blocked, but the pilasters immediately around the opening have been neatly cut back. Were it not for the rock fill and overgrowth within the interior, the improved view here would have been directly into the main apse. With the intentional, intentional uh, replication of the irregularities of a venerated prototype, I hardly think this was an accident. Now, the um, importance of a privileged sight line may also account for irregularities of another Cappadocian church complex, the Karabash Kibise um, in the Solana Valley, whose chronology is similarly difficult. Part of a rock cut monastery, the complex includes four small chapels arranged side by side, but set at different levels and at slightly different orientations. Um, the North Chapel was decorated um, circa 1060, 1061, according to the inscription, through the benefaction of a certain Michael Scopides, whose soot blackened portrait appears in the nave. Um, the paintings are among the finest to survive in Cappadocia. Alas, most are dis disguised behind a layer of soot. An older layer of painting is visible as well, perhaps nice century in date. Thus, the original carving of the space is considerably older than the Michael Scopides intervention. All four chapels must date before his time, but it is unclear if we're looking at two, three, or four phases of carving. Indeed, the architecture of the complex is distinguished by a complexity that belies its modest scale. Now, a cursory glance at the plan might suggest that the first and second chapels formed a two-naved church separated by an arcade, but this impression is misleading. The arcade was broken through only after the carving of the North Chapel. Um, and the floor level of the second chapel is three awkward steps higher. In contrast to the other chapels, this one shows little evidence of wear. An irregular room to the west um, now overlooks the second chapel, but this was originally isolated from it, serving as a sort of vestibule opening into the third chapel at the same level as it. Its western wall has been eroded and is rebuilt in masonry. A burial receptacle is situated at the north end of the vestibule. Now, the third chapel is at a higher level, about 1.3 meters above the second, and is now entered through a low tunnel um, with five steps. The angle changes as well. Small, simple, with a flat ceiling, the chapel has a bench surrounding the nave. The south wall of the chapel is now broken through into the fourth chapel, but originally there was only a small window between the two spaces. Originally, the fourth chapel could be entered only through a low tunnel uh, opening from the west. Clearly funerary in function, the space was intended to be isolated. Its main feature was a large alcove on the south side that was originally filled with a tomb like that in the vestibule. Um, to the east, the apse is illuminated by uh, windows. Um, originally, the wall above the tomb were decorated with images of three deceased monks with their monastic inscript mortuary inscriptions, as well as an abbot named Bathy Strokos. Um, Gerifanion in, uh, interpreted this as a special burial place for monks um, who had played an important role in the history of the monastery. The window opening from the third chapel offered a special point of 
for venerating their memory. Now, the chronology of the complex would be even more difficult to determine if the North Chapel provided the only point of access into the other spaces, as most scholars assume. A likely scenario is that the fourth chapel alone served as the cell of a recluse, a hermitage, with a window to allow him to communicate with the outside. To do so would have meant standing on his own, uh, in or kneeling on his own grave, something noted in uh, some Western medieval anchor holds. In addition, the irregular space to the west of the second chapel seems to have functioned as a sort of vestibule to the um, um, to the third chapel. And these three spaces, the vestibule, the third chapel, and um, the uh, cell on the upper level may have formed the original hermitage. The entrance must have been through the vestibule where the masonry wall now closes off uh, it to the west. The rock in this area is quite eroded on the exterior, but a diagonal setback may mark the remains of uh, carved stairs leading down toward the entrance of the North Chapel. And the North Chapel was likely uh, to have been carved at more or less the same time. In fact, the details of the first phase of painting in the North Chapel correspond to traces in the Hermitage and the Vestibule. All must be late 9th or early 10th century in date. In this phase, there were two separate components um, to the complex, the chapel below and the hermitage above. In this, the complex would have resembled hermitages elsewhere in the region, with the lower chapel and upper spaces as distinct elements. Examined as a whole, the odd feature of the complex is the second chapel, which lacks the detail and evidence of use noted in the others. It was most likely an afterthought cut to join the North Church to the Hermitage. Indeed, um, perhaps undertaken as the complex was transformed from a hermitage to a monastery, but it would have dated not long after the original carving. The arches connecting uh, to the North Chapel were opened, although the two naves were not on the same arch. The third uh, um, third arch, uh, where Michael Scopides was later painted, might have been closed off or partially closed originally, but it's now open as well. Now that it is completely open, however, a visual connection is clearly apparent. From the small window opening in from the hermit cell, one can see through the central two chapels to the entrance of the bima on um, of the main north chapel. The changes in elevation um, and the position of the stairway between the second and third chapels makes the visual connection possible. Here you see a view from the uh, hermitage, the window through the wall there, and the view looking down to um, the north chapel. Um, reversing the sight lines, standing at the entrance to the bima, one could see to the window of the hermit cell. The image of Michael Scopides is painted on the Western reveal of the Eastern arch. He's depicted standing, but he is looking and gesturing to the right, that is away from the bima. And he might have been represented in conjunction with uh, an image of a holy figure on the now missing rear wall of the arch recess, as is sometimes assumed, but with the arch open, Michael appears to be directing his attention toward the hermitage. And this seems to be the intended relationship. Seen from Michael's vantage point, a hermit gazing out his window would have appeared like a framed icon. I propose that the visual axis existed from the early days of the foundation at the Karabash Kibise, developed as the four parallel spaces were connected physically to each other. And while Michael Scopides lived perhaps two centuries after the hermitage was carved, he must have been aware of the monastery's sacred history. Either the hermitage remained as a sacred space commemorating its original occupants, or as I would like to think, the hermitage continued to be 
inhabited. In either case, Michael, as Michael assumed a proprietary role in the foundation, he took full advantage of the sight line. And we might um, view this as an integration of public and private views. But the hermit according, uh, accorded a focused private view from the window of his cell. The public view, looking back from the North Chapel at the gaze, as the gaze of Michael Scopides directs us, would have been accessible to any visitor to the church, a special part of the rich visual spectacle of the interior. There are um, similar windows at the Choro Monastery to which I'll now briefly return. These are more difficult to interpret. On the south wall of the Naus is another internal window which connects to a rectangular chamber accessible from an internal passageway. While carefully constructed, the chamber is undecorated and its function unclear. Because it was uniquely situated between the Naus and the tomb of Theodor Metahedes, Underwood has suggested that it might have been a small uh, chapel or oratory. It might also have functioned as a monk's cell for private meditation, uh, for its occupant could see and hear the services in the Naus. But its relationship to the founder's tomb is also worth considering. Was the space intended for a monk charged to pray for the salvation of the founder's soul, or perhaps a special place of meditation for Theodore Metahedes himself during his lifetime to contemplate his own mortality, situated between life in the nous and death in his tomb. And when we turn to the Paraclesion, there are two more internal windows to consider. The more significant of these opens just above the tomb of Theodore Metahedes into a curious irregular space where the 14th century editions intersect the 11th and 12th century nows. My initial reading of this space was purely pragmatic, um, following the opinion of Ernest Hawkins, that this allowed ventilation for the Paraclesion, which was otherwise closed. It also served to level the roof between the two parts of the complex. However, when crawling in this space decades ago, and that's a, period, a picture of me crawling into that space. Um, um, I noted a graffito image of a monk scratched into the damp mortar. I didn't think much of it at the time, but Professor Churchich subsequently suggested to me that the space may have been the cell of a hermit monk. And this suggestion is worth considering for several reasons. First, the window opening into the space is carefully positioned. Uh, symmetrically in the lunette, that is, its form and location were sensibly considered architecturally. Second, and more importantly, the space is directly above the tomb of Theodore Metahedes. And third, might we consider how the window and the space behind it relate to the iconographic program of the Paraclesion, specifically to the scene of Joseph's ladder, or Jacob's ladder, which frames it with its unique curving staircase. Now, Jacob's ladder was seen as a type of the Virgin forming a bridge from this world to the next, from death to eternal life. This is emphasized in the pendentive next to it where the hymnographer Theophanes Graptos is depicted comp uh, composing a, home, uh, a hymn to the Theotokos. He writes, we've turned back to the earth because we have sinned against the commandments of God, but through thee, O Virgin, we have ascended from the earth, shaking off the corrupt corruption of death. But this comes appropriately from the canon for the funeral service of a layman. And Theophanes here pauses in his writing with and with his pen um, directs our gaze to the ladder and to the founder's tomb beneath it. Taken together, the visual program offers a promise of salvation to the founder. So should we situate the window and the space behind it into this program? Perhaps the presence of an angelic, an angelic monk assigned to pray for the soul of the founder would have offered another intermediary between the founder's mortal remains and his heavenly salvation. Why else would the angel leading the procession uh, on the ladder gesture both 
to the Theotokos as Queen of Heaven and to the window immediately below her. Certainly not if the window were empty. A second window is more puzzling. This opens into a chamber to the other side of the passageway, which was never plastered or finished in any way. Initially, I dismissed it as a storeroom, but the internal window remains a puzzle. Would an unfinished storeroom deserve such elegant ventilation? Particularly as the window interrupts the parade of saints. So this may have been another cell for a hermit, and its placement immediately next to the unusual representation of the dendrite, uh, David of Thessaloniki, may encourage a hermetic occupant to the space. Indeed, for both internal windows in the Paraclesion, their architectural placement and the intersection with the decorative program suggests that they were more than just openings for ventilation. Taken together, the three internal window rooms just discussed physically envelop the tomb of the founder behind, above, and besides. Um, could these have been intended to surround the tomb spiritually as the space is housing special prayers for his salvation? That is, should we put hermit monks back into these spaces? Now, the possibility of internal chambers as uh, cells for recluses raises some questions not fully addressed in the literature. From various saints vitae, we learn that recluses were enclosed or in Pleistos and could live isolated in a variety of spaces, ranging from caves to towers and for varying lengths of time. For those enclosed within monasteries, however, the Byzantine texts are frustratingly unspecific. The location of cells is never clarified, whether they were inside or attached to the church, elsewhere within the monastic enclosure or even somewhere outside it. The peripatetic St. Savas the Younger, who lived uh, circa 1283 to 1347, spent the last, last six years of his life enclosed in a cell at the Quora Monastery, where he uh, passed away. But his vita fails to specify where exactly uh, his cell was situated. Um, revered recluses were often visited by pilgrims seeking guidance or blessings, and this might encourage their presence inside the church proper. The internal windows at the Quora would have allowed communication between recluses and visitors, as well as the possibility for the recluses to observe services, either in the Naus or the Paraclesion. So to conclude, a careful reading of physical and visual evidence in concert may help us to envision how spaces function and how they were experienced historically. Of course, it's much easier to make sense of things when we have an edifying text, as we do for Neophytos on Cyprus. The record of the hermit's, uh, hermit saint's eccentric behavior personalizes the enclaustra and makes its odd collection of spaces come to light. Despite the wealth of Byzantine texts about the Quora, um, these internal windows and related spaces go unmentioned. In Cappadocia, the evidence is similarly meager. Um, with the examples discussed here, interpretation becomes richer and indeed only possible through the blending of the various methodological strategies employed in visual culture and material culture studies. Carefully examined the combination of evidence uh, informs us not just where to look, but how to look. And this in turn helps us to repopulate and activate the spaces to envision them as part of a living landscape and to enter the thought world of their makers and users. So just as the hagioscope helped medieval anchorites to focus their view in Cappadocia and elsewhere, it may encourage present day scholars to broaden theirs. Thank you. Wonderful. I would like to thank Professor Oosterhout for this uh, incisive and really uh, thought-provoking uh, paper. I need to make a full disclosure here. 
Uh, Professor Oosterhout has been my mentor, a travel companion in strange lands, and a friend for over 25 years. I still remember, somewhat apprehensively, the first time I met him in Istanbul. Within 10 minutes, he had me climb a tall wall, cross a pair of railroad tracks, then climb a second wall to show me the remains of a Byzantine structure that he had recently discovered and uh, uh, thankful that the photographic evidence of all this has been lost. Um, in the next few days, uh, in that same uh, visit, we visited most of Istanbul's late antique and Byzantine buildings. It was a truly extraordinary experience that shaped my life as a scholar, for Professor Oosterhout taught me and all his students to look attentively, to observe carefully, to spend time inside and outside the building and to be passionate about historic architecture and its preservation, even in places where very few other, others care. The paper that uh, we just heard is a great example of looking attentively. I suspect that few who have visited the Kora or Tokali Kilise with some frequency paid much attention to those windows, and I certainly had not. The paper also provides much needed information about the architectural accommodation of the Anklisti, these monastics who secluded themselves in a confined space for a shorter or longer period of time. From the excellent discussion of such saints by Alice Mary Talbot, we learned that recluses were not unusual, though most seem to have chosen a cave, a hut, or a cell as their adobe. Recluses inside churches uh, were not that common. In addition to St. Neophytos in Paphos and his Enclistra, already discussed by Professor Oosterhout, I would like to mention one more, Evaristos, a former Studite monk who died in 897. Evaristos constructed a very small enclosure, the Greek word in his vita is skini, located to the left aisle of the Theotokos church in the Constantinopolitan monastery of Kokoroviu, which was in the district to Livos. His vita mentions explicitly that in that way Evaristos was able to sing hymns to God, both privately and jointly with the other monks. That is, he participated from his enclosure in the corporate services that took place in the church. Also from his vita, it is evident that Evaristos' enclosure was a place of self-imposed confinement, but not of invisibility. People could see him. He ate so little that he seemed almost incorporeal and godlike, asomatos and theoides. Some commented, this Abba neither drinks or eats. He was also visited by lay people seeking a healing and interacted with them. Evaristos is, I think, a good example of the paradoxes inherent in some Byzantine recluses. According to his vita, he placed himself in this very small enclosure because he, and I quote, wished to break away from the world and everything worldly and devote himself singularly to the contemplation of God, end of quote. Yet this private act of extreme devotion became a public, a daily public spectacle, since Evaristos performed his ascetic feats inside a monastic church. My second point is more tenuous, but perhaps worth exploring. I was intrigued by Professor Oosterhout's comment that hearing the liturgy may have been more important to the Byzantine solitary than actually seeing it. This perhaps parallels well-known developments in the Middle Byzantine period pertaining to the Templon and the gradual closing off of the area of the Bima with curtains and icons, especially during the Anaphora. The progressively heightened sense of sacredness attached to the Eucharistic gifts and their incomprehensible consecration certainly contributed to this. That the mystery of the Eucharist was entrusted only to the clergy was not a new idea, but it was codified and gained much wider currency and potency starting in the 11th century. Not only handling the elements, but even looking at them became the prerogative of the clergy. Lay people were not permitted to approach the sanctuary, let alone cast their impure gaze on the sacred mysteries. <clears throat> 
Nikita Stithatos, a monk in the Studios Monastery, recapitulated this in one of his letters, and I quote, the ability to comprehend and see these mysteries is offered by God and the apostles only to the offering priests, end of quote. He uh, then quotes a variety of biblical and theological sources justifying his positions that the laity should keep their impure eyes away from the sanctuary. Indeed, during the anaphora, the laity should close as if the doors, uh, uh, excuse me, close as if doors the senses. The closing of, of the temple and doors during the anaphora thus acquired a symbolic function. It encouraged the laity to close off all the doors of the senses so that they concentrate on the acts of the priests, which ironically they were not supposed to see. So perhaps there is a parallel here between developments in um, um, liturgical theology uh, and what we see in the reclauses. Um, Thank you, um, Vasily, for these comments. Um, I didn't know about Evaristos um, and his skinny, but this figures very nicely into my argument. I feel like I could put him into one of my, my little rooms. Although the term skinny here is a little bit strange. Um, so is he living in a tent or? Uh... Yeah, uh, I mean, skinny can also mean like, it refers sometimes to a monastic dwelling. Okay. Uh, so I think th this is what is, is in reference to okay. uh, here. Another word that I found, um, again, uh, looking through Alice Mary Talbot's uh, uh, study on the recluses is uh, Ikiskos. So, um, and the name of this um, saint, if you give me a second, I will find it. Um, uh, so uh, Hilaria, who was the uh, sister of George of Lesbos, and mm -hmm. she was enclosed again in uh, inside the church. And the word that is used there is ikiskos, which means something like a small room, okay. which, which leads to leads me to wonder. Um, so the, the the examples that you showed us um, are, are offer an architectural setting for these recluses. But I wonder if, in, in some cases, these were just temporary constructions uh, that, uh, as a consequence, we cannot identify anymore. Um, that makes perfectly good sense. I think that uh, um, something like this, OK, if a, um, a revered hermit comes to your monastery and says, I want to be enclosed. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have not any sort of provision for that, um, then um, this is one where you could see sort of an ad hoc uh, construction uh, emerging there. But I think that um, looking at these spaces, and I have to say, I didn't think much of them when I first looked at them at the Quora uh, many years ago, but after seeing um, so many of these subs interesting subsidiary spaces and trying to understand their relationship to um, the main spaces of the church interior um, caused me to rethink um, a lot of this. And uh, in discussions with Alice Mary Talbot, whose work is sort of fundamental here, we, um, it's frustrating because the texts rarely say, um, they say, um, the saint was a hermit at the monastery, but they don't say where. Mm -hmm. And um, having um, spaces like these inside the church suggests that they um, must have been functional. And my clue to this or reason for arguing this is the very careful positioning and decoration of these windows. Although if you go into these spaces, they are undecorated and unfinished, but the window is nicely positioned, beautifully decorated um, as part of the um, program of the adjacent space. So it seems to me that if you're, um, the function of a window is just ventilation or something like that, mm -hmm. you're not gonna develop, um, develop it um, 
to such a great degree. Um, now, the other thing that um, from your comments is thinking about um, the writings of uh, Nikitas Stethetos and thinking about what he says about vision to um, close as if doors your senses. And he's saying that, I mean, he's really referring to the liturgy and the liturgical vessels, right? Mm -hmm. But this idea of closing your senses to um, visual stimulation is happening, uh, is coming at a time where we're seeing the development of um, expanded visual programs in the church interior. So I'm wondering how, you know, his comments here might figure in terms of the I mean, basic looking of the visitor or worshiper uh, in a Byzantine church at the time. Were they supposed to look or not look? Were they supposed to not look at what is going on in the Templon, but uh, how did the uh, images in the nows um, figure into, uh, into this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, they were not supposed to look and uh, a small narrow cell that is adjacent to a church helps to close off the senses and mm -hmm. concentrate mm -hmm. on what is going on. Of course, there is a little bit of a paradox here because you are supposed to concentrate uh, on something that you cannot see, but you need to visualize somehow. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there are there are explanations about this as well. Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to return uh, just briefly to uh, one aspect of the uh, recluses in Byzantium that I find quite interesting. And uh, normally, when we hear about recluses, we imagine somebody who is just walled in and. Um, um, mm -hmm. another monastic comes one day and pushes a tray under the door or something like that with food. Yeah. Uh, but apparently that was not the case. Um, and uh, e even those who, you know, were away in caves and so on, uh, needed um, some uh, support system. But certainly those who were enclosed in, in, in churches, uh, as far as we can tell from uh, hagiographic texts in, interacted quite openly with uh, with with people. So um, I think in, in some ways theologically it's kind of difficult to understand what is going on here. And in the life of Evaristos, it says, oh, you know, he wanted to cut off uh, himself from mm -hmm. all worldly things, and yet you know people keep kept visiting him, and uh, the he participated in um, corporate worship and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting situation. And when we think of solitaires, I mean, I, I suppose what comes to mind is like something like the Western European anchorites who anchorites who were immured for life in yeah. their cell. And what we see among the Byzantines, for example, um, one that I didn't talk about is Lazarus Galiziotis, mm -hmm. who seems to be a part-time stylite. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he could sit on top of his column in his monastery. And apparently he had a sort of little hut up there that he could close so that no one can see him um, while he's there. Um, or he could open it up and he could even come down off um, his column from time to time. So the idea of you know the hermit along the model of, I don't know, Simeon Stylites who sits in his column for 37 years and doesn't leave it, yeah. Um, becomes a very different situation when you begin to see the interaction between um, the monastic recluses and their public. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, the other thing I wanted to um, get your opinion on, uh, I think the material that you presented uh, falls, generally speaking, into two categories. So you have these um, uh, rooms, for the lack of a better word, that were considered sacred because they were inhabited by a sacred uh, solitary or recluse, and they were preserved and so on and so forth. And then you have those rooms in in the Kora um, near the tomb of Metohitis. And you know, I'm I'm just speculating here uh, without any evidence whatsoever. But I wonder if these were sort of like 
some kind of part-time rooms where um, uh, monks would alternate in going in for a certain period of time and praying for uh, the soul of Metohitis or the other people in uh, uh, buried in the chapel. Um, is that possible? Yeah, that would make sense. And um, uh, as, uh, we have, you know, we don't have a typicon for the Quora, but for other monasteries, we have uh, um, uh, in the typicon, there will be special requests on behalf of the founder for prayers to be said on behalf of his and her uh, soul. In the Cosmos Sotera Typicon, for example, Isaacus Komnenos specifies very clearly when and how many prayers the monks are supposed to say, and they're supposed to proceed by his tomb to say the prayers mm -hmm. um, at his tomb and so on. So something like this, where um, spaces would be allowed for um, the commemoration of the founder um, after his death, or maybe even during his lifetime would make perfectly good sense. Could I interrupt here and just make one comment? Um, this is very interesting. Actually, I actually have two comments, but maybe I'll just make one right now. Um, I'm thinking about these um, recluses in these spaces and uh, how they're going to inhabit a space for a long period of time uh, versus a temporary occupation of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, it was mentioned earlier that, of course, the person that's inhabiting that space, somebody could bring them food. Uh, I now have to say something that normally we don't talk about a great deal in formal <laughs> scholarly <laughs> situations. There is uh, something that happens after somebody eats. And uh, so is there a chamber pot there? And if they're there for six years, uh, is the chamber pot smelling up the entire complex, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I somehow like the idea of, of more short-term use of these spaces uh, in terms of the odors in the monastery. Uh, and, and then just one more comment um, that occurred to me. Uh, Bob, in your earlier part of your talk, you kept discussing how the holy person would be in an upper level and looking down. Uh, in the liturgy of High Sophia, uh, especially on September 1, which I've been studying, uh, it says that uh, the patriarch comes down mm -hmm. uh, from above to participate in the liturgy at a key moment uh, after the orthros. Now, it never really occurred to me how exactly the patriarch knew when to descend for the key moment, uh, because we don't think that way. I mean, you know, uh, he could have a clock, uh, you know, somebody could text him from the apps or something. None of that's possible. He must have, he must have been able to hear the liturgy and know what is the right time to descend. So I'm suggesting look at High Sophia to see if there are any other kinds of uh, spaces of oral access, which leads me to that room, which is off the, uh, uh, of the, uh, on the upper level on the west of the uh, building, which is decorated with mosaics and which was linked to the patriarchate. Could that be a staging area of the patriarch uh, before he descends into the church? It makes perfectly good sense to me. Um, uh, although I haven't um, looked at this space. Um, one of the things with uh, the design of Hagia Sophia is it's a building that's not really designed with function in mind. And <laughs> so function is kind of an add-on in Hagia Sophia. And when we see um, the, uh, the patriarchate there, um, it doesn't interfere in any way with the uh, internal design of the now uh, or subsidiary spaces. Um, but um, I don't recall there is any visual connection between um, 
this uh, so-called secreton and uh, the interior of Hagia Sophia. So is he just leaving the door open so he can hear when it's time for him to, to descend? That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, yeah I, it makes perfectly good, um, a good sense uh, um, to me, but um, you're the man for Hagia Sophia, so I will defer to you on all of this. No, no, I defer to you. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, you know, one of the fascinating questions we ask or often forget to ask is, you know, how do we populate these spaces? How do we put people um, back into them, moving around and using them? And um, even things like bowel movements might figure into this. But the records that we have of Byzantine saints, uh, <coughs> Um, you know, the, um, the hermits, um, there, as Vasilis has talked about, it seems that it can be a temporary thing and you can um, be a hermit until you uh, need to use the facilities or whatever. Or, you know, when the tray of food comes in, the chamber pot goes out. I don't know. Right. I mean, there are these sorts of delicate aspects of uh, hermetic existence that um, rarely make it into the tax. Yeah. But there thank is, you for elevating our view on all of this. Yes, no, I definitely <laughs> but, there, but there is a moment in, uh, I think it's the life of which saint, it was a stylite, and he's depicted, I believe, in the Metalogian Basil II. Uh, and he's so holy, perhaps both of you know the story, um, and also so dirty because he's been out there on the, um, on the pillow for so many years that fleas fall off of him, and before they hit the ground, they turn into pearls. So there's one aspect of, of how to deal with um, uh, what comes off of the saints. I'll put it this way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, um, um, there are some fascinating accounts of you know, later medieval West of um, uh, saints who are starving themselves to death, and their skin begins to flake off, and this is collected um, by their followers and eaten, which just sounds really sort of ghastly. So sanctity can lead to some very um, weird um, practices. But um, what I think is sort of to go back to what I was talking about earlier, what we're um, kind of struggling with in Byzantine studies is we have so many texts and how do we connect those texts to the spaces in which the events happened? Um, and uh, it's uh, all too often we think of the texts separate um, and sort of uh, separately. And so try, to try and figure out, let's say, um, as um, Vasilis has done elsewhere, uh, just you know how the literature fits into. Um, churches of many different sizes, um, but um, also uh, aspects of special veneration like this that uh, don't get mentioned in the text or get mentioned vaguely in passing. You know, how do we um, um, fit this all together? And what I've argued and have argued, I think, since very early in my career is that we must look at the visual and material culture that goes along with our rich textual legacy with the same sort of nuance that we would apply to a text. Um, and that means um, in the analysis of a church, not just looking at the nice parts that have the mosaics, um, but thinking in terms about all the spaces and how they function together and um, reading the building with the sort of intensity one would apply to a Byzantine saint's life. And of course, we need to keep in mind that texts don't always report the actual truth. Uh, so we need to approach them. Okay, with... <laughs> okay. I, I didn't say that, you said that. <laughs> no, I, um, I agree. And, and this is one of the things that I, I think is useful in terms of um, the architecture and 
um, archaeology that we have uh, of the Byzantine world is that it can offer us a sort of counterbalance um, to the possible exaggeration or lies that appear in the text. So for example, if we didn't have a limited boundary for the area of the Great Palace in Constantinople, and we knew it only from uh, the Book of Ceremonies, how grand uh, would we make these spaces? Uh, when we try to fit them all back into that rather limited territory there, we began to get things back to a human scale there. So the very limited archeology span in an area like the Great Palace can really help us to nuance how we are reading uh, the text related to it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, we have just a few minutes left, but since I uh, now have both my eminent uh, colleagues and friends on the screen, mm -hmm. and they're both emeriti, I was wondering if they would uh, uh, entertain a question about the present and future of Byzantine studies, especially in the United States. Bob? Okay, I was hoping Rob would jump in first. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an interesting situation because um, in um, other countries which have a legacy um, that we do not have in this country, that um, um, Byzantium, from our perspective, is a little bit arcane and distant. And so talking about it in an American academic situation, um, the response I've gotten in a number of situations is, oh, how quaint, isn't that nice? You're <laughs> studying this obscure whatever it is out there somewhere. And um, it, as a consequence, I mean, if you look at most universities in America, if there is a Byzantinist on the faculty, um, it is rare that there will be more than one. And that means that in terms of the kind of interdisciplinarity that our field really demands, um, it's very hard for scholars to kind of um, work when uh, there is no one um, immediate to work with. I'm very lucky in you know, my situation when I taught at University of Illinois, um, in part because I was in the School of Architecture, there was a separate specialist in Byzantine studies in um, uh, the history of art. So I was very lucky to have Henry McGuire to work with for so many years and benefited so much from, uh, from that interchange, but it came at expense. He and I were both responsible for basically the first half of art history. Um, you know, everything up to the Renaissance was what we were supposed to be teaching. And we were in completely different schools. And so the opportunities for us to formally collaborate, uh, for example, teach a seminar together um, happened very rarely and required um, a lot of um, bureaucratic hoops um, jumped through. Um, it's rare in this country that we have um, a quorum of Byzantinists at one university where um, we can um, have a text-based scholar, an image-based scholar, an archaeologically-based scholar, and so on, who can uh, work together or train students together. And what happens all too often is the standard practice in American universities is that positions are up for grabs when somebody retires. And so um, when I left um, University of Oregon uh, many, many years ago, I was replaced by a Western medievalist who didn't think that um, the medieval world should include uh, the Byzantine empire. Um, and when I left um, University of Illinois to come to Penn uh, 15 years ago, uh, my position simply wasn't filled. And so uh, while there was a long tradition of Byzantine studies at the University of Illinois um, through in classics and history, as well as art history and me in architecture, Although I have to say there were a number of major scholars involved there at University of Illinois, there is none left. Um, what is left is the library. 
And this has happened at far, far too many institutions. And you go to the dean responsible and the dean will say, something to the effect, well, you know, the world has changed and we need to think about Latin America or uh, something else that we need to be um, representing um, um, our students' interests more in a more rounded way or whatever the excuse is, often it's a valid excuse, but what happens then is you end up with an incredible library and nobody to use it. Um, and I can tell you any number of institutions that have incredible collections of Byzantine libraries, uh, Byzantine books, and simply don't have anyone within miles to use uh, that collection. And so that sort of lack of tradition in American universities where they say, this is an important field of study, it needs to be maintained, um, is um, often not happening. So. Um, I was very fortunate at Penn when I retired that um, I was uh, replaced, although uh, from the university perspective, this was never meant to happen. And it took a secular miracle um, for me to be replaced. And I'm very glad it happened. Um, uh, I'm hoping that as um, Rob leaves such a distinguished career uh, where he has trained so many students, um, University of Chicago and at Princeton, um, that this is enough to establish a tradition that can be maintained at Yale as well. So enough said on that. I could say more, but- uh, let, let, let me, let me but jump Rob in. Rob, say a few things. Yeah, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I gave uh, one of the, uh, there was a plenary session at the at the International Byzantine Congress. We call it the Byzantine Olympics, which comes about every five years, unless there's a pandemic. Um, and uh, the topic of my paper, <clears throat> it was in a, a session about patrimony. And the uh, title and topic of my paper was how the American experience was atypical in that the people that founded um, and paid for Byzantine studies uh, in America had, had none of the uh, uh, relationships with Byzantium that one has in other countries. Uh, the, uh, the, the founders and the, and the financers of the field were all New England Protestants. They had no interest in Byzantine religion, uh, Orthodox religion, uh, uh, no interest in uh, icons, etc., but they loved the art because they came of, of age artistically at a time when Byzantine art was being was being discovered by the avant-garde, which means the, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and that that emphasis on the art of Byzantium, I think, has is reflected in the number of positions for art historians in America versus the number of positions for people in literature and history. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike in Europe, or, or even for example, England, um, where there are only a couple of art historians uh, with mm -hmm. university positions in England, there are many more people in, in literature and history. So there's been a real uh, overbalance. Uh, one might think that the, the switch to globalization would encourage a more expansive Middle Ages, and in many ways it has. Um, in other words, the, the center of the Middle Ages need not necessarily be Chartres Cathedral or, <laughs> or Canterbury Cathedral. Um, it might be someplace else. Uh, there might be multiple centers uh, possible, which would include Islam as, as well as the uh, Christian Eastern Mediterranean. Um, but that move toward globalization in the humanities uh, was no doubt stimulated by economics, which uh, had, had given us an, uh, an international economic culture for quite some time before humanities discovered globalization. That's ended now for economics. And uh, <laughs> there's much more of a, a move back uh, uh, toward um, individual countries such as America or Western Europe. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if that uh, has consequences on the humanities. Uh, 
And of course, uh, that enlargement of the Middle Ages uh, in the last couple of decades was greatly facilitated by the end of the Soviet Union. Now with the relationships with Russia, will that mean that uh, people turn away from Russian culture, et cetera, et cetera? Um, there are a lot of things to think about, but uh, it's a very interesting field um, which has, uh, has been welcoming from a whole variety of different perspectives. And uh, I think that's one, been one of its, uh, its strengths that uh, because it's not particularly wedded to a certain, at least in America, to a certain national ideology, uh, a whole variety of different methods can be tried and, and used uh, to try to understand this culture. Bacillus, I'll turn it back to you. Well, it, it remains to me to thank you uh, both um, for this uh, very stimulating uh, discussion. And uh, I would also like to thank our audience and we hope to see you in uh, the next uh, lecture on uh, October 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.